Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's SnapLogic Live. Uh, today's topic is Big Data in Motion. And uh, I'm excited here to have uh, Ravi Darnakota, our Head of Enterprise Architecture, as our featured presenter. So let's dive right in. Um, we're going to really introduce you to some concepts and, and take you through, you know, spend the majority of today's time in a live demonstration of SnapLogic Big Data Integration. But first, we wanted to talk about this concept of data at rest versus data at motion. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, buzz right now uh, around this, this concept of data in motion. Contrasting that with you know, data at rest, which I think this example um, speaks to the, um, you know, how this is playing out in the enterprise today. A retailer analyzes the previous month's sales data, uses it to make strategic decisions about the present, mo present month's business activities. So very much a backward looking, you know, how are things performing today, what is the year over year history, um, and, and based on the analysis, making some sort of decision, right? Traditional data warehousing, traditional business intelligence um, are good examples of data at rest. Now contrast that with data at motion. It's a good example here is a theme park using wristbands to collect data about their guests. These wristbands are constantly recording data about the guest activities, and the theme park is able to customize the guest experience in real time during the visit. This is where organizations are trying to get to, and the promise of, of harnessing this big data, capturing this big data, is really um, increasingly being looked to the data lake as the solution, right? How do we deal with this raw data that's, that's coming at us, that's coming, you know, the exhaust of the internet, uh, the internet of things, all these, uh, this, this data that we once weren't able to store, process, and analyze uh, in any kind of meaningful way. So the data lake is very, a very exciting concept and that's what we're going to be spending some time on today. Now, I will say uh, we have worked with uh, industry analyst Mark Madsen on a couple of uh, white papers on, on what is the data lake, how do I think about building it, what are some of the key concepts, as well as how is it different than a traditional data warehouse. And I like this quote from Mark. He says, just as data integration is the foundation of the data warehouse, an end-to-end -end data processing capability is the, is the core of the data lake. The new environment needs a new work, workhorse. So I'm going to bring Ravi in here to really walk you through how we think about the data lake and where SnapLogic plays in this, um, this notion of capturing and really benefiting from um, turning data in motion to valuable insights for your enterprise. So over to you, Ravi, yeah. to uh, take us through these concepts. Yeah, thanks, Darren. So it's very interesting and interesting times. Um, what we're seeing with a lot of our um, customers is that the, there is a strong desire to move away from uh, their you know, 90s infrastructure and move into this modern uh, data lake concept or this data lake architecture. So we're seeing a lot of people moving away from um, uh, expensive archival storage, uh, archival systems uh, and making that uh, as, as uh, a data lake archival. Um, and then also this idea of democratization, uh, which obviously includes things like ingestion and processing. And then finally, being able to provide this consumption layer for different lines of businesses. So with, with those concepts in mind, uh, the enterprise data lake absolutely has to provide some new capabilities. Um, number one, it's the, the obvious one is that it is a cost-effective, scalable storage and computing uh, infrastructure so so that large amounts of data can be stored and analyzed without incurring um, prohibitive com computational costs but the next one uh, which is even more uh, important and interesting is that the the idea of self-service data access and usage so that your analysts business analysts or your data scientists or your data engineers or even the different lines of businesses can find understand and use the right data um, without incurring the expensive um, human costs that are associated with uh, the programming and, and the manual sort of uh, ad hoc data acquisition that, that's usually put in place. So if you've collected a large amount of data that you want to analyze, the go-to method in, in this modern context that we've been seeing is typically to go to Apache's Hadoop framework. Uh, it expands from there on, but with that framework as a data lake, uh, and of course, within that, uh, the programming paradigms like MapReduce and more recently Spark, uh, which is then becoming, you know, more uh, advanced uh, engines like Flink and so on. So it's a tried and true process, and uh, it's being deployed in production at a lot of enterprises. But 
and it, there's always a but, it, it isn't simple. So what are the challenges? The number one challenge is complexity. Um, you know, once you've gotten over the um, complexity to having to uh, put in some kind of an infrastructure in place, uh, perhaps a, a cloud provision even, uh, then an application layer on top, then um, you have to sort of deal with this integrating uh, a plethora of open source tools. And that's just the beginning, right? So Hadoop has a general reputation for being difficult. And this whole big data space is, is, is noisy, a lot of uh, different opinions and viewpoints and so on. Then there's the skill set issue. Uh, companies that want to get serious about data analysis, um, they often have to hire elite programmers, uh, an army of engineers who specialize in, in writing, let's say, a MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark jobs, and so on. Uh, and not only that, the data engineers also have to grapple with, a, again, a mix of Apache projects like Scoop and Flume and Pig, et cetera. So that's what you're seeing in this slide. Um, and add on top of that a constant change. The Hadoop system is large, it's complex, it's constantly changing and evolving. Um, and so keeping up with the developments in that open source community can, community can actually be a full-time gig. So each of those components is, is continually evolving and new tools and solutions are constantly emerging from that community. So a great example is, is how Spark is taking over from uh, you know, the processing engine from yesterday's Starling MapReduce. Uh, even as uh, with uh, Flink waiting on the horizon to take over that Spark from Spark perhaps. So, so very interesting. Uh, but what does all this mean? It really means that most companies with projects in their early stages of utilizing big data um, often just don't have the resources or know-how uh, to take advantage of big data. Perhaps some of these tech companies do, but um, others who, who don't have this, these resources uh, to invest heavily um, just need someone to help them support this idea. So that's exactly what this slide is about. Uh, and it's a representation of the confusion, the noise, the complexity that we're seeing in this space today. So of course, if you start from the left, you have all these different data sources and that's the number one thing. Where is my data and where do I wanna move that? So let's start with the data. It's, it's on-prem apps, it's uh, your ERP, CRM system, it's cloud apps now with that hybrid architecture. Uh, so your CRM in the cloud, your social media, et cetera, even IoT data is becoming very interesting from uh, uh, machine data, sensor data, wearables data, et cetera. And each one of these sources has a different way of, of uh, um, pushing data out or uh, the way you interact with that data. So it could be either a batch or a streaming, real time. Uh, again, some confusion over there. Is it really real time or is it near real time? How often do you want this data to be um, stored and so on. So you see batch, real-time streaming, all of that coming. Kafka comes in, in into uh, a lot of these discussions. But you also see Scoop and Flume and all those different kind of um, open source tool sets. When you've landed that data, um, you then need to be aware of the fact that it has to move between different file formats. Um, perhaps uh, you land that on HDFS and you put a Hive layer, uh, move that into HBase and so on. But between those uh, different landing zones or uh, zones inside Hadoop, for example. You would move from an Avro to a Parquet to a sequence files and so on. Um, once you have that data, you're probably gonna be doing some data prep on it. You, uh, you will have to do some processing uh, and that processing becomes important. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult to deal with you know, which engine to use with. And then finally the data access layer. So with all that confusion, uh, in there, when we take it to the snap logic perspective, um, as you can see in this slide, all of that goes away, and you see one platform handling all of this for you. So what you see in the green is the the data orchestration within the snap logic data integration platform, which will allow you to do uh, integration from various different sources, allow you to do batch real time streaming. Uh, processing of that data using either Spark or MapReduce, and then finally doing a, um, giving you a data access layer for consumption or providing these on-demand, in-time, uh, just-in-time uh, data services layer. So with that, what I wanna do is jump into a demo, but before that, um, um, I wanna mention that uh, we are certified with uh, the, the usual suspects of Cloudera and 
um, Hortonworks, who partners with MapR, uh, and we are very good partners with Amazon Web Services, Google uh, Cloud Platform, and uh, Microsoft as well, um, as all of these different providers um, come into the big data ecosystem. So uh, let's jump into the demo, but the demo will make more sense um, before uh, we, you know, let, let's talk about the, uh, the architecture a little bit. So if you see the architecture, let's go back to the architecture slide. And it's important because we've invested a lot of time here uh, on arch architecting how our platform behaves because of the, the um, uh, hybrid architecture that we're in with cloud apps and this big data playing in. So uh, on the left, top hand corner, what you see is the control plane, which is where the brain is. Uh, that's a multi-tenant application, and that's what you will be seeing in the demo. Uh, the interface, the HTML5, uh, state-of-the-art, browser-based interface, which is drag and drop, uh, and we've done all the heavy lifting for you, but allowed you to put in enough of the custom um, you know, code and all of that uh, so that you can have uh, flexibility over there. That then uh, allows you to execute this either in the cloud, on-premise in your VPC behind your firewall, or within Hadoop as a Yarn native um, first-class citizen within the Hadoop ecosystem. So that's where we're at, and today we'll focus on just um, all of this playing within Hadoop. So let's switch over to the demo now, and I will walk you through what uh, it actually looks like. Uh, this is a, a, a very visual uh, platform because it, it allows you to do all these complex tasks uh, it, with a visual paradigm. So uh, what you're looking at right now is the uh, SnapLogic Elastic um, uh, URL, elastic.snaplogic.com, which indicates that it's on Amazon. Uh, that's just the designer. There is no data being stored over here. So this is a control plane. And there are a few components uh, that, that I want to quickly walk you through. Uh, on how all of this actually fits in. So the first component is snaps. So the snaps, as you can see um, on the left over here, is a catalog of different, um, let's say, connectors or adapters that connect into things like S3 and uh, even in the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, HBase or HDFS, read and write, all the different file formats that you have to deal with, like, you know, like sequence and RC and ORC, Parquet, et cetera, and, and this is a never-ending job for us, by the way, where um, all of this will keep evolving and we will keep adding to this. So every four weeks, we add new snaps and update our existing ones. Um, I don't want to take away the fact that we also support a lot of the different um, cloud apps, let's say like Salesforce or Workday, um, because this is where your data is coming from. Uh, but also on-premise apps like SAP, and your databases like Oracle, et cetera, are also supported. So um, all this, this entire list is available in doc.snaplogic.com, and um, you know, feel free to go look at that. But we also provide a way of doing, uh, making your own custom snap. What the snap actually looks like is this idea of an abstraction of the um, complexity behind any interface. So, for example, if you wanted to interface with, let's say, um, you know, writing, uh, let's actually create a quick pipeline. So, you know, that way I'll be able to show you um, what, what these snaps look like. So, for an ingestion um, use case where you're extracting data from, let's say, Twitter, um, and this is a social, uh, perhaps a social use case where you want to just drag in Twitter queries and um, you know, look at all the tweets and get a particular one, you can start putting in a hashtag of, you know, perhaps um, people interested in the strata cons um, and from there create marketing campaigns for your marketing uh, department. So once you've done that, um, you know, what we do is, is quickly do a preview, give you a, a sense of what these snaps could look like. Uh, then perhaps you want to integrate that with your customers in your SAP um, and then maybe do a join so all these transformations are available as well um, within the platform so you can do a join between those uh, two data sources and you know once you've done that you then format it 
write it to a binary file format, and then maybe push it into Hadoop, so HDFS. And there you go. You have a very straightforward, um, but at the same time, very useful business use case where you're extracting all the social media, combining that with your uh, existing customers, and putting that into HDFS uh, as raw data. From there, um, you can do very interesting things. Um, for example, perhaps um, take that and maybe put it into a Parquet file format. So you have Parquet. Uh, you can even move that into an Avro file format. So both of those file formats, of course, have their own uh, advantages and drawbacks and need to be used in a particular use case. So, so you see a one pipeline one pane of glass where you can do all of these different file format interchanges. And of course, there's compression, snappy compressions, and so on uh, that you have to deal with as well. And SnapLogic would deal uh, that for you without you having to write all that code. Now, it is important to realize that, that this whole analytic space, uh, which is the final goal over here, is a sort of team sport. So it, it becomes really attractive for someone to have big data and, and to make something out of that uh, because um, you want to abstract all of that information, blend it, and democratize that data. So, you know, as I said, these core systems could include different file formats um, such as file data, database data, ETL, streaming data, uh, APIs, and IoT. So all of that coming in through, uh, and then finally, becoming different file formats over here, Avro, RC, and Park, as you see over this, uh, in this um, pipeline. Then, um, of course, once you have the data in, say, a uh, landing zone, you want to make sure that it moves to a processed uh, or a validated zone with, within the, your data lake um, so that you clean some of that up. And so, you know, perhaps you want to do some validation of your employee ID. So you, this pipeline shows you some of that data that's coming in. You see um, that data is not necessarily clean. So different files, uh, different phone formats, perhaps the currency code is wrong. There's a missing department over here and so on. So you want to do some data prep, some curation. Um, and so what you're seeing over here is that idea of being able to take an email address and making sure that it matches that regular expression and doing data validation. And if the data is not validated, then uh, you send it to a, a, a different queue of bad emails. And then you see a list of the, the emails that need to be corrected and um, the quality needs to be improved to those. Similarly, a currency code validation, we're using a REST URI to extract your um, currency code validation from a third party provider. Uh, address cleanup, for example, is another one of those use cases where we can directly um, get this information from, let's say, a Trillium um, for address cleanup or Pitney Bowes and so on. So once you've done the data prep, you then move on to the next uh, layer of this, which is you know, the processing. So how do I do processing within um, the Hadoop ecosystem? And there comes in the discussion of, do I want a um, MapReduce engine or a Spark engine? And so uh, we know a, a lot of our customers um, have been used to the MapReduce uh, algorithm, but they're slowly making the transition over to Spark. So what you see over here is a pipeline that was um, built on the MapReduce algorithm. So you see, uh, if you see the properties here, it, it, it says SnapReduce, which is a abstraction over the MapReduce, and we convert this pipeline into MapReduce code. So if I execute this, you will see in the execution all the different map and reduce tasks and the, the documents flowing through the system. I want to remind everyone that um, the pipelines within the uh, SnapLogic platform are streaming. We use JSON as a document, uh, as a, as a uh, document model. So the same pipeline in MapReduce now with Spark. So if you look at the properties for this, you will see that um, it is a Spark pipeline now. So you know this is an actual user or customer use case where they had uh, Spark pipelines, which we converted to, uh, sorry, it's not uh, MapReduce pipelines, which we converted to Spark to gain increase in performance, and they didn't have to do any changes from a pipeline perspective. They just had to 
um, annotate this as a Spark pipeline. So what we all automatically do is convert your pipeline, take all of this and write it to Spark APIs, utilize uh, Spark RDDs and execute that for you. So you can see um, when we hop on over to the history server for Spark, you'll see all of that, those Hadoop Spark jobs um, actually execute over here. So uh, once you've done the processing, you have all that data that's processed. You can do obviously very complex uh, data transformations as well. What you see over here is that idea of uh, you know taking the snappy compressed file uh, in sequence, uh, even with a basic for gzip in this case, utilizing Spark as a processing engine, and then um, executing it. Uh, and that execution can happen in different modes. So first of all, you can do a scheduled. Um, or uh, you know a nightly, weekly, daily scheduled process. You can also trigger this. So what we provide is this idea of a REST URI for all these pipelines, which can be then triggered from a third-party application uh, or something that's homegrown, which is utilizing um, uh, that URI to trigger these pipelines. Uh, maybe like an ad hoc event or something like that. But um, the interesting thing over here is that we can also um, have you do a low latency um, kind of use case where which we call ultra uh, and which is constantly running and so on so uh, it, it becomes very interesting on how we allow you to do this but uh, one of the most interesting things that, have, that have, is is um, kind of emerging to the um, top with our customers is that we see a multi distribution evolving so we not only see Cloudera's Hadoop being utilized somewhere they also have a parallel sort of uh, Hortonworks cluster, or they're investigating Amazon or uh, Microsoft's HD Insight. So what you are looking at at the SnapLogic dropdown uh, pane over here is this ability for you to switch between these multiple distros. So you've created your pipeline and you've separated out the actual execution plane um, from your design. So now you can just say execute this on uh, a Cloudera cluster or a Amazon HD Insight or a Hortonworks distribution, Google Compute Platform, etc. And as that list grows, you will then have the flexibility of designing once and running it anywhere. So in the Azure space, we also have support for um, the Azure Blob object storage. And then you can see we, we do the, the same processing and write it back to HDFS uh, reader over here. Finally, I want to end this this end-to-end um, -end with uh, what we did all this for and that end goal is basically this this idea of consumption the self-service consumption which is essential for a successful data lake now different types of consumers consume that data uh, and they're looking for different things uh, but it has to be uh, that they access the data in a self-service manner without the help of it so the idea of lakeside uh, or lakeshore data marts and uh, data services which provide you with that capability just in time and on demand through rest apis um, becomes a very interesting concept that some of our customers are looking at. So what you see over here is HDFS, uh, it, it's prepared data, we're mapping it to different schemas, uh, let's say a Redshift schema or different BI tools like Burst or even pushing it back to Salesforce, Tableau, SAP HANA even, uh, and thus democratizing the, the whole big data end-to-end -end process um, and, and making the big data uh, lake or the enterprise data lake a reality. So in summary, the, the truth is that the barrier to have all the data accessible and do interesting, uh, really interesting data analysis should be uh, so much more uh, lower than it really is today. And although big data has been a buzzword for years, actually making the most of it is, uh, it, it is a real problem uh, and is far from being solved. And with SnapLogic, we provide that end-to-end -end platform for you to be able to access data from various sources, blend it, um, deal with the different file formats, but not deal with the manual programming uh, or writing manual code to, to do all of that, including processing and then finally making all this data accessible uh, to the end consumer, be it a data scientist, a data engineer, uh, even a business analyst, and so on. 
Great. Thanks, thanks, Ravi. Great, uh, great overview. We're getting lots of questions here. Uh, we're going to try to um, hit as many as we can, and then we can certainly follow up um, and and, um, and and do a live session uh, with with each of you. Um, first question is around file formats. What file formats does SnapLogic support? Yeah, that's uh, that's always an interesting question when you you know the de the devil is in the details. So um, as I showed over here. Uh, it, this is a sample um, pipeline for dealing with those different file formats. So some of the file formats that are very common, like a sequence or an Avro, RC, ORC, Parquet, et cetera, uh, is all of those file formats are supported within the SnapLogic platform, including the different compressions like Snappy and LZO, GZIPs, et cetera, um, within the SnapLogic uh, data pipelines. Okay. Um, another question, uh, you mentioned that we have a streaming architecture. Um, kind of a two-part. One is, are you processing record by record? Uh, and the other part of it is, do you support Kafka? Yeah, uh, streaming is becoming a very uh, interesting discussion, and people are uh, kind of following that, you know, Lambda architecture was very popular uh, to last year, and then now people are combining the batch and streaming layers. Uh, or, or platforms in perhaps one platform, one single platform. And so in that discussion, the important things that come through is, of course, Kafka is, is definitely one of those top things that people think about to abstract your data ingestion from uh, your sources and into a data lake. So we have a Kafka reader and writer um, in our platform now, so that's supported. Um, and then everything within the SnapLogic platform, as I mentioned, is a JSON document. So we see our document data model is, is supportive of um, just a streaming paradigm, which basically takes each one document at a time, processes it, and moves it along to the next step in the pipeline. Great. Um, another question is about scale. Um, how does SnapLogic scale? Yeah. Um, so when we designed SnapLogic in the Hadoop context, we wanted to utilize uh, with Hadoop 2.0 when Yarn uh, was available to pretty much every application that was written within Hadoop, we created the SnapLogic uh, platform as a Yarn native first class citizen within Hadoop. So SnapLogic utilizes Yarn as a resource negotiator for scaling out uh, the uh, SnapLogic pipelines within Hadoop. So you know we scale out and scale back in um, and, and Yarn does this for us automatically. So uh, one of the questions which immediately comes up is, are these agents and do we have to install this on all the different nodes? And the answer is no. You, we, the way we do it very simplistically is an application master within Hadoop installed on one node that communicates with Yarn and then Yarn takes over and helps SnapLogic Hadoopplex scale out within all your uh, various nodes of the cluster and then scale back in as the load decreases. Awesome. Um, another one is around encryption. Um, how do you ensure the data is encrypted or can you talk about protection? Uh, um, you have it in place during this pipeline process. So just, just generally around security and encryption. Yeah, sure. So security is obviously number one uh, on all of our customers' minds and we get this question as, you know, as soon as they've seen this, where is the data? Uh, and uh, am I putting some of my uh, customer data and my internal data out in the cloud? So going back to the, the way we designed it, everything in the cloud is all metadata. It's uh, only the design of the data pipelines. The actual data sits behind your firewall. This is the idea of moving the algorithm or the processing to the data rather than the data to, um, to the uh, processing. So the SnapLogic cloud platform moves the processing to the actual node behind your firewall and the execution of that data happens in place so none of the data is going to the cloud. That's number one. But as you might have seen in, in this demo, there are the account credentials um, that do have to uh, be stored in the uh, cloud and people see that uh, when, when they're interacting with this. So that data is um, encrypted in an enhanced and advanced way where uh, we let you encrypt that account credential with your private key uh, which stays with you, is generated by you, and nobody, including SnapLogic um, engineers, can um, do, do not have access to that data. So it's all yours, and it's highly encrypted. Great. 
Well, that brings us to the uh, conclusion of today's SnapLogic Live session. Uh, I want to thank you, Ravi, for a very comprehensive uh, overview and demonstration. I know we, we packed a lot into a, a short amount of time, um, but I want to encourage you all um, listening today that you can visit snaplogic.com slash big data uh, to learn more about what we're doing, and um, we'd love to, to talk to you further about how we're powering the modern data lake uh, with, with a new approach to uh, enterprise integration. So thank you, Ravi. And uh, thank you all for attending.